So you are all set, uh, Anita. Okay, so I'm on. You can hear my see see my slides, hear my voice. Great. Well, yeah. um, and I'm starting my timer. Um, so okay, well, thank you, uh, Dee, and thanks to everybody who's tuning in. My topic is the impact of imperialism on national sovereignty, um, and I have special attention to Cuba. And today is special attention to Cuba is very important for a couple of reasons to this presentation. Until 1959, uh, Cuba really exemplified the constraints that sovereignty uh, on sovereignty that imperialism imposes. Uh, second, uh, from 1959 onward, Cuba illustrates the challenges and rewards of successful resistance to and rejection of imperialism. And finally, today is a very important date in the Cuban calendar. Uh, the 26th of July, 1953, is commemorated as the opening salvo in the armed resistance to imperialism that led ultimately to the victory of the Cuban revolution in 1959. So as we know from the first part of this seminar provided a couple of weeks by Alvaro, uh, by Alvaro um, imperialism is in its essence a stage of capitalism. It's characterized by increasing concentration of production uh, and monopolies, uh, the domination of finance capital, and the division of the world among the great powers. As Lenin put it, the exploitation of an increasing number of small or weak nations by an extremely small number of the richest nations. Now, of course, for a long, long time, capitalism has always sought to expand, looking for new markets for its commodities, new labor sources for production, and new sources for raw materials. And of course, subjugated numerous populations during the colonial period. Um, as Marx and Engels say in the Communist Manifesto, the need of a constantly expanding market for its product chases the bourgeoisie over the entire surface of the globe. It must nestle everywhere, settle everywhere, establish connections everywhere. But, the consolid but with the consolidation of the uh, banks um, in uh, the late 1800s, this expansion took a qualitative and quantitative leap. The capitalist uh, economy, the global capitalist economy, sought with a vengeance to divide the whole world into spheres of influence, or as um, Lenin put it, spheres for profitable deals, concessions, and monopolistic product, uh, profits. So now let's go to the other concept in the uh, uh, title, national sovereignty. Um, every political theorist in the European canon has something to say about what's called the normative theory of national autonomy, which addresses the powers of self-determination that a nation should be able to uh, um, apply. Uh, once recognized by other nations of the world, a sovereign nation ought to be able to act with autonomy and independence, regulating its affairs without foreign interference. But in Marx's terms, the idea of national sovereignty is the appearance which masks the reality of imperialism. Instead of 193 individual nation states determining for themselves their domestic and foreign policies, the scope of their actions is constrained by the financial institutions to which they are indebted and the centers of imperialism on which they are compelled to depend. They cannot act autonomously without fear of retaliation, including violence. Uh, in other words, the concept of national sovereignty hides the reality of uh, the real relationships that global capitalism, capitalism imposes on imperial centers and the so-called developing uh, nations. Now, my own background is as a sociologist, and I studied Caribbean political culture for all of my career, um, and I was constantly exposed to the utter inability of the nation states of that region to regulate their own internal and external affairs with autonomy. There are innumerable instances of Caribbean national autonomy being reined in by the United States, whose ruling class considers the region its sphere of influence. Um, sometimes this reining in takes the form of U.S. Marines landing on the beaches and proceeding to use force to install a new government, or international banks creating dependencies and demanding austerity policies, or organizations 
like the International Republican Institute and the National Endowment for Democracy, selecting some citizens and training them to oppose their own governments, which is how they ousted uh, President Aristide of Haiti. And these co these uh, company uh, uh, sources, by the way, have a lot more money now under Trump. So the countries I know best are Jamaica and Cuba, and I just would like to use Jamaica as a um, comparison. Now, for a, uh, a time in the 1970s, Jamaica asserted its autonomy over its own internal affairs. The government of Michael Manley embraced socialism in 1974. It exerted greater control over the nation's bauxite resources, took control of land that was left cultivated by absentee owners and put it in the hands of the rural poor. Um, they expanded free education, social services, and even more dangerously, they initiated friendly relations with the revolutionary government of uh, Cuba. Well, a vicious campaign against Michael Manley emanating from the United States was launched on numerous fronts, including discouraging tourism, selling weapons to rival political gangs, sending evangelical preachers to Jamaica, whose main message was that Jesus wants you to vote against socialism. So by 1980, after a very bloody election, the pro-socialists were defeated and a new US-friendly government came to power, it was generously rewarded by the Reagan administration. Some of you might remember the Caribbean Basin Initiative. Well, we always thought that that was such an offensive and repulsive term, um, kind of akin to uh, the shithole countries that we're experiencing now um, with our current president. Um, but they also called it called the Caribbean America's backyard. But all these terms really do reveal the reality of the relationships between the imperial powers and the weaker states. So how is that exploitative power developed and maintained? So for now, we want to turn to Cuba. And I think Cuba exemplifies where I'm going to paraphrase and, and butcher Walter Rodney's wonderful title, um, you could say, well, his title was How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, but we could look at how the United States underdeveloped Cuba. Cuba resisted Spanish domination from uh, 1868 onwards. And uh, I, I'm seeing I'm already sort of uh, running late, late, but they fought a bitter, bitter war, the Spanish-American War. Uh, with the Spanish-American War, the uh, US uh, took control with a flat in it amendment, which gave the U.S. power over um, Cuba. Um, at the same time, um, U.S. companies like United Fruit set up plantations, um, paid workers uh, starvation wages while bringing all the profits back to the United States. At the same time, organized crime syndicates from the United States developed hundreds of brothels and casinos in Havana with far fewer restraints than they would have had in Nevada or New Jersey. For more than 50 years, the labor of Cubans and the natural resources of the country were completely in the service of U.S. interests. Then on the eve of the armed struggle against imperialism's henchmen, Fulgencio Batista, poverty, hunger, and illiteracy characterized the vast majority of the population of Cuba, especially outside Havana. And I do want to get to this before we um, I can close, and that's uh, today. Um, what's celebrated is a handful of revolutionaries from the Federation of U University Students and the Orthodox Party organized about 100 men to seize control of the weapons at the Moncada Barracks in Santiago de Cuba. Um, many aspects went wrong. It was a, a bloody um, uh, disaster. Um, Batista's army rounded up more than 60 rebels and dragged them back to the barracks and tortured and executed them. They strewn the bodies around to make it look like a firefight, but nobody was fooled. And that was, a, that was the first of Batista's big bloodbaths, and his regime ended up killing more than 20,000 Cubans before the revolution was finally successful in 1959. Um, when uh, the revolution won, the new Cuban government asserted its autonomy vis-a-vis -vis gl global capital, um, and the U.S. began a relentless campaign of propaganda, sabotage, diplomatic isolation, and assassination for the next 60 years. I see I'm running out of time, and actually I, I wrote all this up as a... As a um, an article because I knew I would run out of time. But just to give you an idea of what else is in here, um, after I, I do talk about imperialism's war on Cuba, the blockade and its effects, um, and then I want to talk about how Cuba, I'm, um, 
Cuba celebrates anti-imperialism. Here's a here's a a, a, a billboard at um, Playa Heron, the Bay of Pigs, uh, and it calls Heron the first great defeat of Yankee imperialism in Latin America. When I first saw that, it was I was taken aback, but I think they're right, you know. Um, and here's the the anti-imperialist plaza in Havana. Um, which is right outside the U.S. Embassy and used uh, to communicate. So in the rest of my, uh, my presentation, I, I go back and I look at, well, what are the consequences for these two countries? Cuba, who successfully resisted um, imperialism, and, um, and Jamaica, which, uh, except for the 70s, really seems to capitulate to uh, imperialism's every uh, need. And it turns out Cuba is doing much better than, than Jamaica. Um, you know, police killings per year, I just want to point this one statistic out. Uh, we, I, I could find maybe one indicator of uh, one person who was killed by police in, in the last X number of years in Cuba. In, uh, in, in uh, Jamaica has a, a, a police killing rate that's 10 times that of the United States. So for every one person killed in the United States, the Jamaican police kill 10. Um, so, uh, so I will make that, that article available to anybody who is interested and thank you for listening. That's it. And 11, 11, yes. I'll turn it over to you, Dee. Okay, thank you, Anita. Okay. Well, uh, thank you very much to Anita for that presentation. There's an overlap you you mentioned the uh, the the uh, Reagan policies on the Caribbean, and I'm going to talk about that too in relation to Haiti. Uh, this talk is on imperialism and immigration, how imperialism sets in motion vast movements of migrants and refugees, and how this impacts all workers. Uh, briefly, I'm Emil Skeppers. I was born in Johannesburg, South Africa. I have a PhD in anthropology and I'm a member of the CPUSA National Committee, National Board, Immigrant Rights Subcommittee, Peace and Solidarity Commission, and International Department, and I live in Virginia. Now, imperialism is in its in neoliberal phase, uh, but as Anita pointed out since the beginning, under capitalism, the uh, big capital tries to move into every nook and cranny of the world it is goes everywhere in the world for in its search for greater profits and imperial policy makes sure that it's able to do so so but labor is not allowed to do this imperialism restricts controls and channels the movement of labor uh not in the interests of the worker but always in the interests of capital Yet in spite of this, the destruction which imperialism wreaks, especially in the poor countries, sets off mass migrations on a scale unprecedented since the Second World War. Here are some statistics. According to the UN Department of Economic and Social Affairs, in 2019, there are 272 million international migrants. And that was a jump of 51 million or 19% since 10 years before. And according to the United Nations uh, High Commission on Refugees, there are now 79.5 million uh, refugees in the world, the highest number since World War II. And this is massive movement of people from the poorer regions of the world to the metropolitan, the wealthy developed countries. Uh, I We'll give you just one example, but I'd actually prepare to talk about a couple of other countries. If people want copies of the slides, I'm glad to send them to you. Let's look at Haiti in the Caribbean. Uh, Haiti was the, the second country in the Western Hemisphere to gain independence from uh, the Euro European colonialism of the early type, and in this case of France. It's also the most African country in the Western Hemisphere, but it continues to be the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere also. Uh, historically, rice, had, rice cultivation had been a very major basis of Haiti's food production 
for its own internal market. But with that self-same Caribbean Basin Initiative, which Anita mentioned uh, under Ronald Reagan, US imperialism working with a very corrupt and sinister regime of a president named Baby Duck Duvalier, were pushed for Haiti to accept more and more imported US agribusiness rice. Uh, and uh, it's important that we remember that that rice that the United States wanted to sell to Haiti was heavily subsidized by US taxpayers. So as a result, Haitian farmers were pushed off the land. Some people could buy cheaper rice in the cities, but farmers were ruined on a large scale and Haiti became dependent on uh, on US imports and foreign and other foreign imports and also food aid. So in 1990, when radical Catholic priest, President Jean Bertrand Aristide was elected president of Haiti, he promised to reverse this tendency. But seven months after his election, he was overthrown by a bloody military coup. Thousands were murdered, driven into exile, Aristide also in exile, uh, and the new government canceled all the reforms, including the trade ones. Aristide asked President Bill Clinton to help push the military dictator, Gen dictator General Raul Cedras out of power and restore Aristide to the presidency, which sort of happened, but Unfortunately, the price was a further opening of the Haitian economy to US agribusiness imports to the detriment again of Haitian farmers. And it's not an accident that the main rice producers who benefited from this were from Arkansas, uh, President Clinton's uh, home state. And there was other stuff that happened, a violent coup in 20, 2004 again, which was abetted and supported by the United States, States, France, and Canada, other foreign intervention. And it ends up with Haiti, the Haitian economy in terrible sh shape. And this is spurring large scale migration, especially to the United States and also across the border uh, to the neighboring Dominican Republic with which Haiti shares uh, uh, a land border on the island of Hispaniola. The statistical result today, or rather 2018 figure, 32.53%, nearly a third of Haiti's gross domestic product comes from remittances sent to Haiti by Haitians living abroad in the United States and elsewhere. The remittances means that Haitian migrant workers earn money here and send some of it home to their relatives and communities back in Haiti. Uh, it's still the poorest country in the hemisphere and moreover Haitian immigrants here in the Dominican Republic and in other places are treated, uh, are treated with base, vicious racist repression and discrimination. And uh, so that's, one example of how the, the push factor in uh, immigration is uh, intimately connected with the current state of imperialism as an economic, political, and military force. Now, how does this affect workers in the United States? Uh, oh, sorry. Sorry, that's the wrong slide here. Uh, when we hear talk in politics in this country about uh, immigrants, especially darker skinned ones from poorer countries, uh, the right wing here, Mr. Trump et al, represent them as murderers and rapists and also as inveterate moochers and stealers of American jobs. This, this is a calumny. Many of the immigrants and refugees coming to the United States today have experience in working class struggles in their countries of origin. And therefore, when they come here, they are not averse, in fact, are motivated to join unions and join our labor struggles here. 
and we know of many examples. Uh, for instance, in the 1990s in Cal California, it was the large and successful uh, justice for janitor campaigns uh, spearheaded by Service Employers Employees International Union. And in Chicago, there was more recently an important struggle around Republic windows on the north side of the city uh, in which uh, United Electrical Workers played a major role. And these were all heavily involved, immigrants were heavily involved in all of these, uh, these struggles. And uh, that shows that, first of all, immigrant workers with or without papers are part of the US working class, no matter what Trump says. And it refutes the idea that they're just passive people who work cheap in order to help steal the jobs of US workers. But the ruling class and the state use the immigration laws to put immigrant and refugee workers in precarious situations which undercut all workers in the country. For example, if, if, under, if un, undocumented workers go on strike and protest and, and get engaged in demonstrations, they risk arrest and deportation, which will leave their families destitute, both their family members here in the United States and the ones back in the home country. Uh, and uh, undocumented and the deputizing of local police to act as immigration enforcement agents adds to this worry and increases racial profiling. There's a recent scandal in Los Angeles which shows that not for the first time, police have been falsely identifying young minority men as gang members, which if they're arrested and they're not US citizens, even if they're legal in the country, could very well lead to their deportation and all that that implies. Uh, and the policies of the Trump administration have greatly exaggerated these fears. Uh, Non-citizen immigrants who lose their jobs have limited access to the social safety net. Even if they are legally in the, in the country under the current Trump administration, they're, they're, they, in the act for public aid, they may be impeded in get, eventually getting US citizenship as public charges. And if they're undocumented, they can't get unemployment checks, they can't get me Medicaid, they have to rely on private charity. And this is why so many immigrant workers now are working right through the, co the COVID-19 pandemic and getting sick and dying at a, at a horrible rate. They have no way of, of just protecting themselves. So this- Less than a minute, Emil. Okay, nearly there. So what do we do about this? First of all, we have to fight against imperialist policies, stop interventions like the ones in Honduras 2009, Libya 2011, stop imperialist sanctions like the ones that the United States imposes on Cuba, Venezuela, and other countries, fight for fair trade regimes uh, so that poor countries are not crushed down by uh, unfair uh, trade arrangements and protect the environment from climate change and global warming, which is also displacing millions. And one more slide. Uh, oh, wait a minute. We have to defend the rights of immigrant workers and their families in the United States. We have to educate the public that immigrant workers are part of our working class, not enemies of US born workers. We have to counteract the racist lies and we have to push the government to make sure, the Congress to make sure that all immigrants living in, and working in the United States have legal status, full rights on the job in the community, and access to all uh, of the social safety net. And one more November is terribly important for this. Uh, the Trump administration has been the most vicious in history, in recent history, in attacking immigrants and has been terrible on imperialism too. So let's get them out of power. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Emil. All right. Uh, 
Hello, my name is CJ Atkins. I am the managing editor of People's World, where I serve with uh, a collective of committed folks who work every day putting out the news of the labor and people's movements. I'm originally from Arkansas, and I have a background in teaching and research in political economy, Marxist theory, and U.S. politics. In this segment of the seminar, we're going to take a look at how the growth of the international far right is connected to changes in the global political economy and how the coming to power of the far right in the U.S. has accelerated and reshaped some of the shifts in U.S. imperialist strategy that have been underway for some time. From Brazil to Turkey, Philippines to the USA, and far too many points in between, uh, the authoritarian right is on the rise internationally. Now, there are debates over who is or what is and isn't fascism, but in many countries, I think it's safe to say that there's a politics that looks a lot like fascism uh, emerging right now. And though each of the movements and leaders that, that are listed here uh, are unique products of their societies, there are some common factors that help explain why they're all growing in influence at the same time. And as you might expect, a lot of them share similar ideologies. So we'll be taking a look at those. First off, we'll start with the question of why now? What's the context for the right's growth? Well, for more than 30 years, the global economic system has been chipping away at the foundations of democracy pretty much around the world. Neoliberalism, that policy package which included getting rid of unions, privatization, deregulation, free trade, free movement of capital. All of this has been steadily under undermining the functioning uh, of the social democratic compromise that sort of defined those years after World War II. And it's something that politicians have been selling to us since the late 70s, early 80s. And they implemented it quite successfully, such that by the time of the global financial crisis in 2008, 2009, it was really starting to look as though the economy was something that existed outside the bounds of democratic debate or, or any kind of social control. Free trade agreements and international bodies like the WTO, IMF, World Bank, all of these dominated by Washington, they seemed to matter more than what national legislatures had to say uh, in most countries. You take all of this, you add in the threat of terrorism, which has been sort of ever present since 9-11, and you have an atmosphere where security threats produce fear, and fear enables political manipulation, which is something the right took advantage of. At the same time, the, the results of neoliberalism start showing up, especially in the form of massive inequality, which we saw encapsulated in that slogan of the 99% versus 1%. Now, so far, this is a story that many left-wingers and, and even some Trump supporters might be able to agree on, right? But the dispute comes about whenever we, we have to decide, how do we interpret these changes? Who do we pinpoint as being responsible for them? And what solutions do we, do we turn to to fix the problems that they've created? The right's answer, what the right wing offers for all of this is sort of a reactionary counter-revolution, uh, a new old order. And it's pretty much the same whether you're dealing with Trump or Duterte in the Philippines or Bolsonaro in Brazil. They combine a critique of globalism with pre-existing prejudices around nation, race, religion, and ethnicity to create what turns out to be a very dangerous politics. The right's answer to globalization is national rebirth. They all talk about the need to restore their country's past glory. Under Trump, of course, that takes the form of make America great again. It used to be great, we just need to find a way to recapture that. And the right says the way we do that is with an emphasis on authority and order. Previous leaders were either incompetent or, or traitorous. They were responsible for allowing the country to decline and they opened the borders to outsiders. Just think about the claims that Obama let China or Iran or Europe or Mexico or, or whoever uh, run over the United States. You overcome all of that with the authority and power of a strong leader. As Trump says, I alone can fix it. I am your voice. You combine this with uh, a really sort of twisted vision of economic independence in which the country is seen as facing both internal and external dangers, whether it be immigrants, refugees, minorities, and radicals, uh, or the agents of the globalist elite, all of them working together on the inside and on the outside uh, to manipulate and denigrate the country for their own gain. 
So in brief, this is sort of the essence of the programs that the far right has used to triumph in a lot of countries so far. But what does it mean when it's applied to the specific case of US imperialism and, and US imperialist strategy? Now, everyone says that Trump is reckless and unpredictable, and it's true that he is. Uh, but, but is there an actual direction or an intentionality in how his administration has exercised US power in the world? I think the answer is yes, but it's shaped by his right-wing ideology uh, responding to trends that were really already there before he was elected. US imperial strategy is now experiencing a shift that predates Trump, but he's giving it his own aggressive spin. For some time, the world has been transitioning from this uh, unipolar global capitalist system that operated under US hegemony to a multipolar one where the rise of China has really changed all calculations. Back in 1990-91, when the Cold War ended and the Soviet Union went belly up, the US enjoyed unchallenged supremacy as the only superpower. The class struggle was over and capitalism has, had won. According to bourgeois scholars, it was really the end of history. And in the years that followed, both Democratic and Republican administrations alike implemented that strategy of neoliberal globalization that we summarized at the beginning. And it came to be known as the Washington Consensus. Even former uh, and still existing socialist rivals, Russia, Eastern Europe, China, Vietnam, all of them were integrated to greater or lesser extent into the global capitalist economy. And when it came to military affairs, well, the United States was the unmatched dominant power in the world, pretty much able to wage war whenever and wherever it wanted, all through the 1990s and, and into the 2000s. But as it turns out, uh, that the end of history was rather short-lived, actually. Neoliberal policies left people poorer and worse off in country after country. The US war machine faltered in both Iraq and Afghanistan. The Great Recession came along, pulling the rug out from under capitalism. Uh, Russia managed to revive itself economically, mostly thanks to oil. And most importantly, China saw a period of unprecedented growth. All right, so what are the specifics, though, of U.S. imperial strategy under Trump? First of all, it reorients U.S. imperialism away from the so-called war on terror and turns toward uh, a supposed containment of adversaries, especially China, uh, but also to a lesser extent Russia and even regional rivals like Iran. Just think about some of the things that we've seen from this administration when it comes to China. There was the blockade on Chinese investment in U.S. companies, the tariff war, uh, the sending of U.S. aircraft carriers to the South China Sea, and efforts to try to split China's neighbors away from it. Secondly, the strategy aims to foster U.S. strength by intensifying the domestic security apparatus, things like border patrol, building the wall uh, on the Mexican border, Muslim bans, the recent stormtrooper secret police tactics, stepping up mass deportation, threats about law and order. In all of this, what Trump wants to do is solidify uh, a base for right-wing nationalist policies here at home, using racism, xenophobia, misogyny, anti-socialism, and anti-communism to target his opponents. Third, there are attempts to shield US industry and high technology from competition. The desire is to intensify US-based manufacturing and technology not out of concern for creating jobs, as he says during campaigns, but rather to strengthen US imperialism against its adversaries and cement the place of uh, US capitalist monopolies in the major industrial sectors. Fourth, there's a move away from policing the global neoliberal order in favor of protectionist policies, more one-on-one -on -one trade deals, less of the multilateral alliances kind of capitalism that we had for a while and less reliance on international bodies overall, more America first. So these are some of the highlights of the Trump version of US imperialism, but we need to understand that the fundamental direction of this strategy is not likely to change even when he's gone. And that's because US imperialism is trapped in a sort of strategic contradiction. It can't really control the world in the same way that it did after 1989, but it also can't leave behind the system that it built. Uh, the U.S. has suffered relative geopolitical decline 
while China, by contrast, has seen its political, economic, and military power all increase. But U.S. capital remains completely integrated with and for the most part in charge of the world capitalist system. Uh, there's just an important point I want to make uh, before we move on, and, and that is that the U.S. decline is relative, not absolute. You know, U.S. military power is still overwhelming, and it's still the only country that has over 800 military bases positioned around the world. All right, just to close us out uh, for this section and bring us up to date here in the middle of summer 2020, uh, the global coronavirus pandemic and Trump's failed response to it have really only ratcheted up the confrontational approach to China even more. From his racist accusations about the China virus to the dispute over 5G technology and the closing of China's consulate in Houston this week, I think we can expect a lot more provocative actions in the months to come. If Trump loses in November, uh, there will certainly be adjustments to the tactics of U.S. imperialism, and a Biden administration will surely craft its own version of this China containment strategy, probably more multilateral, less confrontational. But the essential aims will carry over. I think we're in a period when Republican and Democratic leaders are going to trade blows with each other over who is smarter in dealing with China or who's being too soft. Uh, in some ways, it's, it's going to be a replay of Cold War dynamics, that whole soft on communism rhetoric of the last century. But as dialectical materialism teaches and as Marxist theory reminds us, it's happening under completely new material conditions. So I think we can't just take the old pattern of U.S.-Soviet confrontation and expect that things are going to play out in the same way. So I'll just stop there and, and turn it back over to Dee. Thanks. All right. Thank you, CJ. Uh, we have three more presenters, but before we go to the uh, second set of presenters, we'd like to open the floor for um, um, comments and, and questions. Can you pronounce your name? Uh, I go by Armando. Okay. Armando. Hi. Um, thanks, thanks for, um, for your presentation today. Um, I realized that the first presentation there was no mentioning of the um of the uh the the expansion of of tourist e uh, economy of cuba um i was just hoping that you talk more about the about the um the tourist uh economy of cuba plus the the um semi open uh borders of cuba uh with the united states because uh it's still it's still happening you know i mean i could you know uh travel to cuba from uh any airport in the in the united states it's just the difference is, is that i need to find a special uh traveling agent for me to uh travel to cuba from the united states so i was hoping that you guys talk more about the uh, the semi-opening uh, phase of Cuba and the United States, as well as the uh, tourist economy of Cuba. Thank you. Let's take a few more. Colin, your mic is open. Open your mic from your end, please. Colin, yeah. Hi. Hi, uh, welcome. Uh, thanks, everybody. Uh, I'm in the UK at the moment, listening to your uh, podcast, um, so web webinar. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think it's just the um, the poorer countries where you got US uh, hegemony and uh, imperialism that's affecting countries. I mean, you've got countries like Australia, even the UK to a, to a large degree. Um, so I don't think it's just the poorer countries that are um, affected by uh particularly american imperialism thank you thank you colin looking for raised hands looking for raised hands irving open your mic on your end Hi, um, I just want to to uh, congratulate the organizer. I think they've done a wonderful job. But I, my main question is, uh, what steps can we do, or can the people in, in, in the Caribbean do, 
to to struggle to struggle to struggle against uh, U.S. military um, uh, might and in, in imperialism, particularly U.S. military might. Thank you, Irving. A few more. Looking for raised hands. Please do not think that we'll be able to um, look at the written comments. Uh, Lennon, your mic is open. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. So I have actually three questions. I do believe one of them was answered or was stated before and possibly could be could be examined down the road. So to uh, Comrade Anita Waters, uh, the question is, in the case of Cuba's struggle against anti-imperialism, how has Cuba been able to survive the U.S. blockade? I do believe an elaboration of that for, you know, those who aren't in the communist sphere or are not in touch with Cuba could definitely, this could definitely be like a good, uh, a good uh, analysis of just to see how, just to see how they made it. To Comrade Emil, uh, and this is sort of a rephrasing of another question that was said earlier. What are the working class of the Caribbean countries, such as Haiti, such as Haiti, are doing to struggle against the ruling class, and in this case, U.S. imperialism, as it was said? Have there been any recent developments, and how have the communist parties been doing against the struggle? Are they leading the charge, or is it more progressive or liberal voices that are at the forefront? front and to comrade CJ uh, in the case of sort of what you could call a second Cold War is China using imperialism to destroy the US sphere of influence or is it something slightly different for this can it be an examination through the definitions of through the liberal definition of imperialism versus the Leninist definition of imperialism summarized by summarized by Stalin if you want to look through it. But yeah, that is that is what I have written down. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll take uh, one or two more and then turn it back to the panelists. Taryn, your mic is open. Open your mic from your end, please. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, yeah, no, I was just wondering if the panelists could speak a bit to the situation in the Middle East, because as CJ mentioned, yes, of course, US imperialism has sort of um, been pushed back uh, by what had happened in Iraq, uh, and although it's not in the Middle East, to some extent in Afghanistan. And I was just wondering, um, you know, what the party's view is on, uh, for instance, what's called like the axis of resistance in the Middle East, which is like Iran, Hezbollah basically reacting to NATO intervention in places like Syria um, and to, you know, Israeli uh, machinations in Lebanon. And also just that uh, the Israelis are now saying that they're going to be annexing a huge part of Palestine, sort of like, how does that all fit into how we're viewing imperialism today. Thank you. One more. Shelby, your mic is open. Please open your mic on your end. Shelby, your mic is open. Please open your mic on your end. All right, uh, Shelby, I don't see you opening your mic on your end, so Okay, did you want to raise a question or introduce a comment? Shelby, your mic is uh, open. Yes, yes to, to uh, CJ. Uh, it seems as if uh, there was big, big splits within the Republican Party when Trump first uh, ran. Uh, is that um, accurate? And uh, it seems to have been just as big almost as splits between uh, the Republican Party and the Democratic Party, but now the Republican Party seems to be so solidified. Uh, if I'm right, how do you explain that? Thanks. 
Okay, now we're turning the mic back over to the uh, starting panelists. And uh, Anita, can, can we do in the same order? Anita briefly will respond, then Emil briefly will respond, and then um, CJ briefly will respond. Is that, is, are we okay? All right. Okay, thanks, Dee. Well, I'll uh, be fast at, at this. Armando uh, raised the questions of tourism and Cuba opening up. Cuba is part of the global economy. It must import a lot of um, goods. It needs foreign currency, and for that reason, it welcomes visitors. Um, Cuba had 4.7 million uh, visitors last year. Well, Jamaica, by the way, had 2.5 million. So, of course, Cuba is a much larger country, but we don't think because of we're in the United States, we don't think about visitors to Cuba, but it's very common for the whole world to go there and visit. And that's where they get foreign currency. And it does introduce some problems into the economy. Uh, and I think um, they're addressing those, those things. Um, what to, how to fight military might and, um, and fight against imperialism in, in the Caribbean, I, I'd say, um, well, we and, um, and others can support Cuba's effort to end the blockade. Cleveland, Ohio uh, passed a, a resolution uh, um, against the blockade recently. And in the Caribbean, I think fighting corruption and expanding social um, services to, to ordinary people, I think, I mean, when I think about uh, Jamaica, I, I mean, Jamaica is just, um, seems like a mess uh, as far as I think getting getting the guns out of, of, of a place like that might be a, a first step. Um, and how has Cuba been able to sub survive the blockade? First of all, great relationship with United uh, the USSR until uh, 1989. Um, but um, I think goodwill and good relationships with other countries, like, you know, they have the Henry Reeve uh, a Brigade, which uh, sends doctors to the world really, Cuba is like the the medical school of the uh, the world for a lot of people, um, and I think they have a lot of goodwill uh, around around the world in Africa and and Europe and and uh, and and of course Latin America. So I think that's how they have survived, and they're you know they're more independent now than they were ever. I think so. Thanks. Thank you, Anita. Emil. Very briefly. Okay, uh, well, I won't try and answer all of those questions. First of all, on Cuba, the international solidarity has been very important, and I would advise everybody or suggest that everybody go to cubanobel.org, which is a petition to give Cuba's health, international health care workers the Nobel Prize coming up. And uh, also, Anita mentioned the resolution in the City Council of Cleveland. Uh, if Cleveland can do it, getting resolutions like that done in every single city and state in the country is very feasible. There are about 13 or 14 that have already been passed. In terms of the class struggle in the, in the Caribbean, well, that's quite a lot of very small countries and some larger ones. Uh, Anita spoke to Jamaica, and of course we know the situation of Cuba. Uh, in some of the other countries, there are strong labor union movements. Uh, the only communist parties of, like ours in the whole of the island Caribbean are the Cuban one and one in the Dominican Republic. But everywhere there are rebellions, there's a constant uproar of rebellion against the situation in, in Haiti for instance, but of course, as you can imagine, imperialism allied with local elites does everything it can to divide and crush and, and destroy any resistance, even when there's a facade of democracy. Uh, St. Vincent's in the Grenadines has a left-wing government now that's allied with Cuba and the other left-wing countries of the world but it goes back and forth. Guyana is up in the air. Guyana has gone back and forth between left and right wing governments after the last election. I think the decision of how the election went has not even been resolved. And imperialism has its fingers, of course, in every pie. Okay, thank you, Emil. Uh, CJ? 
Okay, thanks for the questions. Uh, I'll just quickly preface what I'm going to say is that, you know, whatever I offer in answer to some of these uh, is not official CP policy. Someone asked, what's the party's view on such and such? But so this is just, you know, my analysis and starting off in conversation with a lot of people. So I'll, I'll offer at least some thoughts on a couple of these questions. Uh, Lennon asked about, in the case of the Second Cold War, is China using imperialism uh, to challenge U.S. imperial power? So I, I kind of understood that as a question about, is this a situation of inter-imperialist rivalries, you know, to use some of the old terminology? Uh, I would say no. And I think it's, looking at China is, and how China exercises its influence in the world is a very complex question. Uh, you have, you know, the, the, the sort of central policy of the Belt and Road Initiative, which is uh, China's investment and partnerships with countries all across, uh, uh, you know, from China heading westward, really all the way toward toward Europe almost. And in that cases, and especially in Africa, in those cases, uh, you have investment without the coercion that often comes with U.S. imperialism. You don't have the interference in internal affairs in the same way. Uh, are some of the traditional patterns of capitalist investment being repeated? For sure. And those raise a lot of contradictions and problems in the countries where the investment happens. Uh, but at the same time, those governments are welcoming uh, that boost to their development. So it's it's a complex picture, I guess, is a, a sort of unsatisfactory answer. Um, in so things like the South China Sea, uh, plenty of China's neighbors have differences with it over who controls this island or that island, including other socialist countries like Vietnam. So. Uh, it's a messy picture that uh, I think merits a lot more analysis, but I, I would not say it's analogous to U.S. imperial strategy in, in, in most of the world. Uh, secondly, Taryn asked about the situation in the Middle East. Uh, right now, U.S. policy in the Middle East sort of seems to be in a holding pattern of still to be determined, uh, with a lot of the initiative left to Israel, uh, and that's resulted in some very negative outcomes in, in a number of places. Uh, of course, we've seen the Trump administration still not hesitate to exercise power whenever it came to, uh, you know, sending cruise missiles into Syria. Um, but you put that alongside with his pledge to try to get out of the, the Middle East and reverse Obama's failures. And uh, it seems to just be a, a holding pattern is how I would say. And there's there's not a clear direction yet that shifts away from what the U.S. goals were. Uh, but it's not clear what, what they want to do next. Um, finally, to Shelby's question about big splits in the Republican Party when Trump first ran, I think the different segments of the capitalist class were split over how to approach Trump. Uh, some of the smaller manufacturing capitalists, uh, big energy, they were willing to get on board with Trump because they saw in his agenda things that could benefit them. Whereas high finance and some of the big tech companies were more reluctant and you saw them put more of their resources toward, toward the Democratic Party. Uh, but once Trump was in office, um, all those sectors benefited from his policies of deregulation and big tax cuts, and uh, and you saw a lot of them come around to Trump. And even uh, you know the high tech companies before they were worried that Trump was going to cut off their access to their manufacturing facilities, their cheap labor in China, in in Asia and Southeast Asia. Um, but what they've seen is that some of his policies are good for them. Just look at the whole 5G technology thing. Uh, this whole campaign against Huawei. Chinese companies are ahead of U.S. companies in the race to develop the next uh, high-speed network uh, technology. And the Trump administration, by demonizing Huawei, calling it, you know, a, a spy, a cover for espionage and spying, all of that benefits U.S. companies. It allows them the chance to catch up and uh, and to promote their products in in third countries. So I think what we're seeing is that a lot of capitalists have reevaluated where they stand next to Trump. Are they still put off by a lot of his strategy? Probably. Um, but they also see there's a lot in it for them whenever, whenever they can get it. So I'll just stop there. Thanks. All right. Thank you, panelists. Uh, we will have another set of uh, panelists present, and we will open the floor again for uh, the discussion period. So if these panelists could shut down your webcam and then reboot your webcam when we open for the next discussion period. Thank you. There you are. So good morning or afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, I'm Roberta Wood. I'm 
spent my life as a working class activist in the labor movement and as a communist, so it's my honor to be able to give this presentation. My teachers have been my comrades in the Communist Party and my co-workers over the years at U.S. Steel, at General Motors, and in, most recently at the sewage treatment plant where I was an instrument mechanic. After I retired, I wrote and was an editor for People's World and served as the secretary treasurer of the Communist Party till last year. I live in Chicago with my husband, Scott. We have four daughters and eight grandchildren. And I'm interested in figuring out how the working class gets from here to socialism. If you're intrigued by any of the ideas we talk about here, I'd love to hear from you and I'll put my, uh, inf my contact information in the end of this. Um, and now uh, I'd like to move on to our presentation. Let me get with this PowerPoint, okay. Um, so today we're in the era of imperialism 2020 and the working class is dealing with four interrelating crises, a deadly pandemic, the subsequent economic devastation, enormous inequality and racial injustice, and a crisis of environmental disaster. Uh, the pandemic has brought all of these um, into focus. Denise, is, is my screen coming up with the web with the webinar information on it too, or is... What I see is the pandemic has brought these interlocking, that's all. I just wanna make sure that you're not seeing my webinar controls. Okay, thank you. Um, so um, I don't know um, about the rest of you, but um, when I first, well, let's look into what, um, <clears throat> humanity has a long history of dealing with, with pandemics. It's not a unique thing. And in every case, um, it's wreaked devastation on people. Um, and not only from the disease itself, but because the uh, people were no longer able to work, crops failed and people died of starvation. It's, let's look at the smallpox epidemic, which left no one um, able to plant and harvest crops. The bubonic plague in the, uh, in the 13, 14, 1500s led to decades of famine in Europe and Africa. And yet, um, uh, Today, when we have when we're faced with this um, horrible pandemic, I think humanity is suddenly faced with a different uh, situation. When I know so many people told me when the first um, uh, uh, CARES Act was passed that they were so um, surprised to find out that the government had a trillion dollars to give out for uh, assistance. And I don't want to minimize the terrible suffering that's happening, not only here in the United States, especially with undocumented people who get no help, but around the world where it's expected that maybe a quarter billion people could starve. But it's obvious that humanity is no longer in a situation where with the pandemic, it has to lead to starvation. Um, for the first time, humanity has the resources to, to sustain itself over many years. Uh, and that's, I think, an important thing to think about in relation to the working class, because that's what's created these resources. So let's take a look at gross domestic product. Um, we hear that GDP term a lot, but what does it really mean? Um, well, I'm usually hearing about a country, but we're going to talk about the world. And the gross domestic product is the market value of all the goods and services that are produced in a single year. And he, I wanted to show you here the growth in the world GDP from the year 1500, that's the picture we showed of the bubonic plague, <clears throat> up to the present. Um, no, this chart is not wrong. All of the years from 15, 16, 17, 1800 were so little of a, a GDP that it can't even show up here. And finally, sometime in the middle of the 1900s, it reached the value of a trillion dollars. And somewhere in the middle of the 1900s, um, it started uh, really going up. And you could see now, in the year 2000, we've gone up to 20 trillion. And in the 20 years since then, from 20 trillion up to 100 trillion, which is the GDP 
um, in this year. Let's look at the more recent years more closely. In 1960, when a lot of us were around, um, the GDP, that, that is the services and goods that the whole working class of the world produced collectively was 1.4 trillion. And that has gone up 1973 trillion, 80 it tripled to 11 trillion, 90 it doubled to 23 trillion, then 2000 was 33 trillion and so on up to uh, 2017 when it was 81 trillion. Um, so I point, make that point to show that the um, amount of, of goods that are produced by the world's working class is enough to do not only to sustain people over years and years if necessary, but um, uh, it's, it's really shocking. Um, the assistance to workers in the U.S., as I mentioned, is easily um, offered was $4 trillion, and there's lots more that could be done. In Europe, um, they were able to pay the income of workers who were sitting out uh, production. And in socialist countries like Vietnam, uh, they supported, which is still a developing country, and in China, the population was supported and the essential workers were protected. In Vietnam, there wasn't one single death reported from the uh, coronavirus. All of this is possible because of the super productivity of the world's working class. Um, and uh, Okay, so um, the goods and services, sorry. <clears throat> The goods and services are not the only product of the working class. The working class also reproduces itself, and in doing that, it's producing a more and more productive working class. So um, let's look at some of the characteristics of the world's working class today. First of all, it's size. Of the 7 billion people that make up the world's population, 6 billion are working class, a large and growing percentage of the world's population. This is a group that is multinational, multiracial, multigender, and multigenerational, and consciously so. Um, astronomically exploited. And when we say exploited, it doesn't just mean that they're living in, in bad conditions, but it means the amount of their, that they're producing is not going back to them. I couldn't come up with a bigger adjective than astronomically, but um, I'll show you how big this is. Here's the level of exploitation. We said that there's 100 trillion GDP this year. 60% of it goes to compensating the workers who produce it in one form or another. But the other 40% of the 100 trillion goes to the owners of the means of production, the capitalists, the billionaires. Most of that, or the bulk of that, goes to the 0.01% who are the billionaires. So everybody knows this 40% pays for their lavish lifestyles, but there's only so much money you could spend on caviar and boats and planes and mansions. And more than that, they, they have the power to decide what to invest that 40 trillion in capital in. And that capital shapes the world we live in. So their investment decisions are based on potential profitability not on benefiting the workers who created it. And here they are, uh, some of those dirty dogs. Um, uh, I'd like to say that besides the bad decisions that these guys make about what to do with the, uh, what the working class has produced, that 40 trillion, the capital itself takes on its own power and it, it has its own drive for increasing profits. Um, it, it drives to spend money on prisons instead of schools. It drives to spend money on oil pipelines and not running water for people who live on reservations. It spends, it, it has a drive to spend for military equipment and not healthcare, anything that's more profitable. Back to the characteristics of the world's working class. It's connected and interconnected through an inter 
interdependent division of labor and of, as Neil mentioned, the movement and migration of workers across the globe. Every product that is created is created by a division of labor around the world. Let's take a look at this. Here's a little quiz and uh, we'll get the answer at the end, but um, how many members of the working class do you think are linked to the production of this iPhone? How many of those 6 billion workers? And uh, if you want, you can put your best guess in the chat and just some background information. The physical components of an iPhone come from at least 37 different countries. Back to the working class today. We Another characteristic of the class is it has enormous inequality within the class, inequality within countries and inequality with, between countries. A large component of our class is marginalized or more than marginalized, excluded and cast out due to incarceration, due to immigrant detention, due to wars and refugee camps, homelessness, and the extreme poverty um, that results in uh, people ha having a lack of education, bad health, and even dying, this enormous waste of humanity and enormous suffering. Another characteristic, and you can see these are almost like contradictory characteristics of the working class. This is a highly skilled class with experts in engineering and in, in tech and management. Um, and, a class that has members who are capable of running and doing everything in the world. It's an educated and literate class and one that's able to draw on its own history to write its own story. And I think we're seeing that more and more as people come out of the working class, come out of working class movements and are not spoken for by others, but speak their own piece, uh, even becoming elected to various offices. And we have a working class, a world working class now that's politically sophisticated, that's engaged, that's activated, that's interested in taking action to control the use of their labor. So we have many workers who aren't, who are in addition to struggling for safe working condition and wages, also care about what happens to what they do. We've seen protests in the tech world where people don't like what uh, who work for Facebook don't like what the products of their labor are used for and have made protests similar with companies like Adidas. Um, and I just saw the Wall Street Journal um, staff was uh, up in arms and collectively uh, struggling against the opinion editors of that publication. Many members of the working class today live in socialist oriented countries. And we see in our working class an ever deepening understanding of the intersection of racism and male supremacy and capitalism. So um, just to wrap up, um, I wanted to give some examples of international solidarity and the possibilities. This is a screenshot from a meeting that took place just Be a couple of the time. I'm sorry, what? Be mindful of the time, it's over time. Uh, this is a screenshot of a meeting that took place just two days ago. Uh, the, the steel workers, part of a global federation that brings people together who are paper workers and talking about and planning solidarity on dealing with the coronavirus. Here's an example um, from an Industrial, which is an, one of those international federations that brings people together who work for Shell Oil and other industries. If you want to subscribe to their newsletter, you'll find out a lot of uh, on the ground studies about um, his, about what's going on in different countries. It, the web, the uh, site is on the bottom there. And finally, um, let's look at some examples of solidarity from around the world with us, with our struggle here on um, uh, against police um, violence and the killing of George Floyd. Here's a shot from Latin America. Here's one from Korea. Kenya and Romania. This is it, our world um, working class. It has a lot of future, it has a lot of possibilities. I think um, we can see a class developing that will not only fight for socialism, but be able to build it. Uh, I would love to uh, hear more. If you have any comments about this, I invite you to read uh, this pamphlet, Marxism in the Era of Amazon and Uber. It's available at the CPUSA website. You could contact me if you have some ideas. 
want to discuss what's been presented, there's my email address. And the answer to the quiz is how many workers involved in the production of the iPhone? It's the answer is six billion. Every worker in the world is interconnected with producing every single product that we use. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to be talking about, I'm Henry Lowendorf. Um, my background is in biology, and I spent many years transferring technology from university labs to uh, companies that could manufacture them commercially. Uh, I've been active in the peace movement since the war in Vietnam in the 1960s. Currently, I'm uh, the chair of the Greater New Haven Peace Council. I'm on the executive of the U.S. Peace Council. And more recently, I've become the chair of the Communist Party USA's Peace and Solidarity Commission. So what I'm going to, what I'm going to present has to do with how we fight the wars abroad and the war at home, how we end the destruction of people or prevent the destruction, the ongoing destruction of people, culture, civilization, and nature, and how we oppose white religious nationalist supremacy. And I was hoping that I could, uh, let's see. There. I'm going to be speaking about eight points but primarily focus on the first. The eight points are move the money, close the bases, abolish nuclear weapons, end the sanctions, convict the Pentagon for its destruction of the climate, demilitarize the police and defund the Pentagon, uh, engage in solidarity with nations targeted by US imperialism and solidarity with indigenous peoples, colonized peoples and minorities. As I said, I'm going to focus on move, most of my time on move the money. And I will deal with this in more detail than the other ones. The economic crisis and the pandemic that we are now facing in the United States and globally, but uh, focusing on the United States, is accelerating cities and states going bankrupt. There are increasing numbers of layoffs, service and pension cuts, local and state tax increases. The infrastructure of our country and our localities is uh, being allowed to decay. It is not being taken care of. We are living on the investments of our ancestors. And of course, infrastructure includes clean water and sewage the roads, bridges, the rail system, dams, etc., schools, libraries, service workers, and so forth. All of these are being sacrificed because, in large part, the United States spends so much money on its military budget on its wars and building weapons. The proposed budget, which has uh, passed the House, for $741 billion is, according to this particular uh, graph, is 55% of the discretionary budget of the US. The actual money spent on the military is half a billion dollars more because it's hidden. For example, nuclear weapons are not part of the Pentagon budget and the sabotage that uh, this, the US aid and State Department and various entities of the US government uh, carries out against various countries not included in the Pentagon budget. Now this would, this should, this enormous treasure that gets spent should be everybody should be talking about it but that isn't the case in particular the candidates for election at national level are 
barely mentioning it. And local candidates and state candidates do not talk about the vast money amounts of money to go to the military budget and that is what we are trying to change there is a move the money campaign for human move money for human needs that is growing in this country there's local organizing taking place in cities around the nation there have been resolutions passed uh, and uh, referenda uh, put on on uh, ballots in New Haven, Charlottesville, Connecticut, New Charlottesville, Virginia, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Nevada City, California, and in New York, the proposal to put this on the uh, put this resolution and public hearings in front of city council is ongoing right now, and there are some a number of other cities as well. The purpose of these local resolutions and local organizing is to get the discussion started because we have, to, we have to organize at a local level with the people we know, our colleagues, our friends, our family, our neighbors. On a national level, the US Conference of Mayors has unanimously passed a resolution calling to cut the military budget drastically and put the money into human needs. For the most part, that has been ignored across the country. And even the mayors themselves who passed it, are hardly engaged. There is a poor people's campaign and uh, that's calling for a $350 billion cut and transfer that money to human needs, cut in the military and transfer it. And Barbara Lee and others have introduced a resolution to the House calling for that cut. At the same time, another resolution went into the House calling for just a 10% cut. $74 billion, and that recently, in the last few days, got voted down uh, by, if you look at the bottom here, that 10% cut failed, 93 to 324, 93 uh, Democrats, primarily Democrats, voted to, for that cut, and 324 Republicans and Democrats voted against cutting the military by just 10%. And here's what a transfer of from the military, not the 10%, but the full military, would mean to a city of the size of New Haven where I live. So if we took nearly $164 million from the Pentagon, we could get the following, 2300 1200 2300 monthly relief payments of $1,200 each for one year. And also at the same time, 590 infrastructure jobs for one year. And at the same time, 300 elementary school teachers for one year. And at the same time, 9.6 million in 95 respirators. And at the same time, 700 university scholarships for four years. That is what we are missing because of this enormous military budget. That is what we have to fight for. So what's the point? The point is to force a discussion locally with all of us, all of us being the centers of this discussion, reach out to friends, family, and coworkers, and to organize a resolution in our city councils or a referendum to reach out to organizations to support this, to encourage public hearings on moving the money, so that people will really understand how much money goes to the, the Pentagon and how much money goes to war and weaponry. That's the point. The second way to fight back is to close the bases. This has been referenced already in this seminar. There are uh, over 800 bases. The Pentagon doesn't have an, won't provide an accurate count, but we know there are over 800 U.S. military bases in foreign countries, and, and the pink on, or uh, magenta on this map shows those countries that have U.S. military bases outside the United States. And there are two organizations, two coalitions that have been organizing conferences and urging people to fight against these bases. One, the No Foreign Bases Organ Coalition in the United States and the No U.S. NATO Bases Coalition that held a conference in Dublin, Ireland two years ago. 
The third way to fight back is to abolish nuclear weapons. Most of the nuclear weapons in the world belong to now Russia and the United States, the vast majority. And the United States is leading a new nuclear weapons race by investing nearly $2 trillion over 30 years in building new nuclear weapon systems, which includes the weapons, the explosives themselves, and the delivery systems like nuclear submarines, planes, and missiles uh, of various sorts. The United one, minute, States, one minute, Henry. Okay, the United States has exited a number of nuclear weapons treaties and it has ignored others and it is deploying weapons across Europe. The fourth way is to end the sanctions. The sanctions are a means of economic warfare that block countries from being able to buy and sell and feed their people and provide medicines. The fifth is to convict the Pentagon of destroying the climate. The Pentagon is the biggest polluter in the world and it's the biggest global greenhouse gas emitter among other things. The sixth is to demilitarize the police and defund the Pentagon. The police are militarized in so many different ways and most of the actions of the police do not involve violence. In New Haven, 96% of the police calls don't, have, don't involve violence. The seventh is solidarity with nations targeted by US imperialism. This is a small list of them with uh, some of the information about how they've been targeted. The eighth is solidarity with indigenous peoples, uh, colonized peoples, minorities. This is, a, this is also a smaller list. And finally, I'm going back to all of the eight points that I have just given you. Here is a list of references, and I presume Dee can make this whole presentation available. Thank you. Yes, the presentation will be in the recording. Thank you, sir. Okay. Well, thank you, Denise, and, and good afternoon, uh, uh, comrades. Um, very happy to uh, be with you here this afternoon. I hope everybody is staying safe and strong, um, physically distant, but socially close. It is so important. We need uh, each and every one of us in these <clears throat> challenging times. That's kind of become my mantra. It's going to stay my mantra uh, until they find a, a, vac a vaccine. You, you can't overstate the importance uh, uh, of it. Um, our subject today is the significance of international solidarity, um, or what we call working class or proletarian internationalism, past, present, and uh, future. It is admittedly a huge subject. And so in this Black Lives Matter moment, I want to narrow, if you'll allow me, its focus and, and address it from the standpoint of the fight against racism. This is important because racism has been a central thread, um, anti-Black racism, uh, a central thread um, and the development of capitalism in general, um, and in particular during its imperialist stage. So the first point I wanna make is that capital is international um, and solidarity in the fight against it has also historically been international. One example of this was the uh, fight against slavery uh, here in our country. Uh, Karl Marx and, and Frederick Engels, as you know, were firmly against slavery and supported the union uh, in its fight uh, against it. Um, what you might not know is that even before the formation of the first international, Workers in uh, Britain, uh, for many different persuasions, opposed slavery and supported the union's cause. Um, that was important because there was strong support amongst the British ruling classes 
for the Confederacy. Now, behind that support was the export of cotton, which made the anti-slavery stance of the British workers even more important. You see, there was a naval blockade of the South, and that naval blockade resulted in the shutting down of factories in Britain and, and, and substantial unemployment. And there was an effort to persuade the workers that their interests lay with supporting slavery by ending that blockade. But the workers said no. And in a number of big meetings that were organized throughout the British Isles, that anti-slavery sentiment was made known. And the result of that was that the pro-slavery forces uh, in government and in the ruling classes, the factory owners were pushed back. The point here is that even before um, the birth of the first international, international solidarity and anti-racism, uh, were present uh, in the workers' movement. And the greatest act of solidarity that they could display was in defeating the policy of their government and ruling class, right? Big lesson in that, which we'll come back to in a couple of minutes. Second point that I wanna make is that the international character of capital resulted uh, in contributing to the self-organization of the people uh, who it oppressed. And in this case, the self-organization and self-movement of people of African descent. This occurred principally in the Pan-African movement, so in the uh, birth of uh, the Niagara movement led by Ida Wells and Monroe Trotter and W.E.B. Du Bois, and in the birth of the NAACP. The Pan-African Congresses, um, you'll remember, coincided with the birth of imperialism as a world system. Um, the Berlin Conference, for example, which divided up the African continent was held in 1883. By 1900, uh, 17 years later, Henry Sylvester Williams of Trinidad organized the first Pan-African Congress in London, calling for equal rights for black people and the countries under the rule of the British Empire. Uh, a young Du Bois uh, attended that Congress and it was here that he penned his famous, the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. The second Pan-African Congress was notably held after World War I, and it was organized by Du Bois to bring attention uh, to the League of Nations, which I believe was meeting in Paris. And, and, and he wanted to present to the League the demands of black people, both on the continent and in the diaspora. Um, and the main issue, of course, was self-determination for people of color uh, around the world. An issue that was uh, dramatically brought to the fore by the Russian Revolution. I wanna pause here for a moment and stress the importance of that revolution in St. Petersburg on these developments. You see, it was not only important from the standpoint of class liberation and working class power, but it also helped spark democratic and equality currents around the world. Uh, the Russian Revolution helped place self-determination and equality uh, to the forefront of the work of the communist and workers' parties. For example, here in the United States, our party took up the fight against racism in a serious, principled way, viewing it 
as crucial to achieving class unity. Um, one expression of that was uh, the case of the Scottsboro defendants, which became a cause celebrate not only here in the United States, but it was also taken up uh, and championed by our fraternal parties uh, around the world. We understood that, that the fight against racism had an inherently international character and that, and, and, and that it had to be consciously, uh, deliberately brought to the forefront. Another example of this understanding was the We Charge Genocide Petition brought to the United Nations by Paul Robeson and William Patterson in 1951. The Cold War uh, attempted to suppress these initiatives and for a time in the United States, they managed to do so. But that Cold War ice was broken um, and the black question reasserted itself first with the work of Martin Luther King Jr. in the civil rights movement and also by Malcolm X. King, however, took things to another level merging the civil rights movement uh, with the uh, anti-war sentiments, um, uh, with his opposition uh, to the Vietnam War. You, you remember he said that the bombs uh, dropped in, in, on Hanoi were exploding in Harlem and the south side of Chicago and in south central uh, LA. At the same time, however, another major international solidarity campaign was emerging that was to create international shockwaves. And that was the campaign to free Nelson Mandela and to defeat apartheid in South Africa, campaigns that were initiated by the World Communist Movement. And, and in this regard, can, can we forget uh, the campaign to free Angela Davis, which was another major initiative of, of the communist and workers parties. It was, it was um, Henry Winston, for example, that first called for the release of Mandela uh, in our country and for comprehensive mandatory sanctions against the racist regime. We helped initiate a campaign to collect a million signatures to drive South Africa out of the United Nations. Uh, and these campaigns were the, were the seeding grounds for the free South Africa movement uh, that emerged in the 1980s and the campaign, uh, the divestment campaign um, that uh, uh, put so much pressure uh, on that racist, uh, regime. In the period after the collapse of the Soviet Union and uh, the democratic breakthrough that took place in South Africa, the international dimensions of the anti-racist movement underwent another change. For a time, you'll remember that the issue of reparations gained center stage under the leadership of Randall Robinson and Trans Africa, leading up to the World Conference on Racism that was held in Durban, South Africa. But this too uh, was shoved off stage by 9-11. And then for 20 years, these issues seemed in ebb tide until the murder of uh, George Floyd and the, and the tremendous uprising that has taken place in our country, which precipitated demonstrations of international solidarity around the world, not seeing, um, well, I, in my nose say a quarter century, but, but maybe never. And so, and so now in, in conditions of, of, of COVID-19, in conditions of world, uh, economic depression and environmental crisis, the question occurs, uh, what is next? How uh, 
uh, will these issues take hold and, and come uh, uh, to the forefront and what form uh, will they take? Well, we don't have a crystal ball, but what we do know is that we can take a lesson from the workers of Great Britain and understand that our greatest contribution uh, to the world, uh, to the planet, um, um, is to defeat the uh, a policy uh, of Trump uh, and his backers and their intervention in Cuba and uh, Venezuela, uh, this new Cold War against China that they are trying to initiate um, uh, the, the uh, effort to save our planet, uh, to rejoin the Paris uh, climate change talks. All of this uh, depends on our ability uh, in November to March uh, from the streets to the ballot box and uh, to defeat Trump. And these are some of the lessons I think that, uh, that uh, the, the last century of struggle have taught us. Thanks for listening. All right, thank you, Joe. We will now open the floor again for uh, discussion. If you would, this is D Miles. I work with the Education Commission. If you would like to uh, make a comment or introduce a question, please click your raised hand icon and I will try to scroll through and find your, okay, Josephine. <clears throat> and we'll take several uh, questions or comments. And then we'll turn it, <clears throat> sorry, turn it back over to uh, the panelists. Josephine, your uh, mic is open. You have to open your mic on your end. Josephine Yuri. Just click your mic on your end, click your mic on your control panel, and it'll open. Use your mouse hover over the the mic and click it on your on your end all right sorry looking for raised hands looking for raised hands sam your mic is open open your mic on your end just click the mic there you are Hello, yes. Uh, my name is Sam Horn from Cleveland, Ohio. Um, thanks to all the panelists today. Uh, my question is, and it was kind of mentioned by some of the panelists, um, it's about climate change. Um, climate change is obviously, to me, the most you know existential threat facing the species right now, um, and uh, clearly exacerbated and literally caused by capitalism. Uh, and I am curious about how our panelists think that uh, the state of capitalist imperialism will change uh, as capitalism worsens, um, and you know what can some of our responses to that be? I know that's a pretty broad question, but um, just uh, just kind of how imperialism and climate change are going to interact and affect each other. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Looking for other raised hands. Tony, your mic is open. Open your mic on your end. Just hover over your the picture of your mic and click. There you are. Speak up, please. Tony, you have to speak up now. Okay, this is Tony Ryan um, from San Francisco. And I, I again, I, I think other people feel the same way. Thank you all the panels uh, for these great presentations and this great meeting. Um, I wanted basically uh, to speak um, very briefly about solidarity with Cuba. As, as was mentioned, today's July 26th, it's Cuba's national holiday. And I think it's appropriate that we've had this webinar on this day. Um, and we understand the role of the Cuban revolution uh, historically and today. And without going into a lot of detail, very specifically, the medical brigade of Cuba, the Henry Reed Brigade, which was mentioned earlier, is in, in almost 40 countries all over the world 
and is on the front line in the struggle against the virus. Um, and of course, U.S. imperialism and the United States is in deep shit with the level of uh, viruses that the high, uh, it's the highest in the world. And I think it's very fitting that, um, I mean, there's a lot of motion as in, as in a lot of other things. Within the Cuba Solidarity Movement, there's been a tremendous amount of work that's occurred in the last bit of time. And, oh, and Tony, then, you, have to, you have to wrap it up. We, we're, okay, we're, I'm, I'm, I'm coming. Um, I just wanted to just thank everybody. I, I urge people to get involved as much as they can. But also, very, very fittingly, this week in San Francisco, the Board of Supervisors passed a, res a resolution unanimously around this question of interacting and collaborating with Cuba, the city of San Francisco, city and county of San Francisco. Thanks. Thank you, Tony. We'll take a few, a few more. Terry, your mic is open. Please open your mic. Yes. You are. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Comrade D. Thank you, Comrade Panelists, for all your good work. Uh, my question is, what specific steps can we take right now to link the militancy in the streets um, generated by the uprising that started with the cop murder of George Floyd to the struggle against imperialism? And specifically, how can we link up the people in the streets here with the people in the streets elsewhere in the world, because it seems to me that uh, international solidarity, as Joe was talking about, is uh, a key to linking those two struggles. And I would just like to hear the panel speak to what practical steps we can make to open up forums where uh, those links can be forged. Thank you. One more. Just a moment. Just a moment. Oh, here's a voice we haven't heard in a while. Estevan, your mic is open. Open the mic on your end. Yeah, you you are. How y'all yep. doing? How y'all doing, everybody? Uh, good, to, good to see y'all talking, comrades. Um, I was just going to ask, how can we connect? And I think it piggybacks off with the, um, what the person who spoke before me asked. How can we connect the uh, move the money demands with the defund the police demands? Um, and I just think about the, the party's long-term um, slogan uh, against war, racism, and repression. And it just makes me think about police, military, industrial complex, prison industrial complex, ICE all that. Thank you. All right, we'll take one more. Marjorie, your mic is open. Marjorie, click your, there you are. Hi, yeah, I have a question. Um, I know we talk a lot about getting Trump out of office and in the fight against imperialism, but I'm kind of wondering like, you know, how do we feel about a, a third party? What are we doing about a third party? Because it seems to me like, you know, having Biden in there and, you know, even on a local level, even progressives, you know, um, it, you're still, it's still continuing the imperialism. Oh, and I also meant to say thank you to all the panelists and to having this webinar. But yeah, I just, I just kind of want to know, like, um, in the, in our fight against imperialism, how we, how we feel about third parties. Thank you, Marjorie. Now we're going to turn the mic back over to each of our panelists for a very brief response to the comments and questions. Those of you who still have your hand up, uh, we will have many opportunities in the future. So Joe, since you're, uh, so if all of the panelists could, um, and we'll start from the top, maybe Anita, if you would, um, come back in and uh, give your comments to the last set of statement of comments and questions and your summary remarks. Anita. Anita. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, I can't I can't see myself, but um, I uh, oh here it is. Share my webcam. Um, I just want to say uh, I I have um, I mean some of the the questions in in the last section also overlap with what we talked about in the first part of the discussion. Um, I think uh, the I, I have um, little response. I mean, beyond what have we what we already said earlier. Um, but I, I really appreciate the the last um, uh, presentations. I think uh, the combination of all of them really um, adds up to um, uh, some important ideas on imperialism. And I want to thank Tony. I I, I should have mentioned uh, that San Francisco um, resolution. It's a really good step. It's a new approach to a resolution supporting uh, the end of the embargo against Cuba. So I hope um, people will look into uh, Cuba solidarity and other international um, solidarity uh, work. Um, and yeah, that question of that, the uh, I, I really liked CJ's screen about the 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 the, the difference between Biden and uh, and Trump. Of course, you know, might be a not a, a a deep difference, um, just a, uh, a difference in, in approach, but not a fundamental one. But I think, um, so I think we have to struggle, keep the struggle up on several different levels, but uh, that would be a start. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll see from there. Thank you. Emil, very briefly, please. Okay. Uh, well, I think the main thing here that we are in a different phase. The uprisings and movement uh, that were set off by the George Floyd murder uh, has really, really made a breakthrough in terms of the sheer scale and also the, inter the ideological quality of, of the struggle that's going on right now. We can't miss this opportunity. I think I've worked on anti-imperialist solidarity work for a long time and a major flaw in the past has been that things have been done on too miniature a scale. You know, I've seen and I, you know, I disparage nobody who's tried, but I've been in so many little committees of which are basically five or six people dealing with an exile community of a couple of hundred people in some town or city. And I think we have now the chance that we have to strategize how to make this a movement, make anti-imperialism a movement of millions and millions. And, uh, you know, I think that the secret is precisely to link up with the Black Lives Matter movement, with the labor movement and uh, stuff of that kind. So I hope the, the discussion continues about exactly how we do that, because it's an opportunity that of a scale that I've not seen, at least since the anti-apartheid movement and since the Vietnam War. Thank you, CJ. Okay, I uh, just want to thank everyone who came out for this and, and all of the uh, fellow presenters as well. Uh, you know, Lennon said that there are decades when nothing happens and then there are weeks when decades happen. And I think over these last uh, a few months, we've been living through one of those periods where decades happen uh, figuratively. You know, from the, the uprising against racist, racism and police violence, to the whole coronavirus pandemic and more. Uh, a lot of the things we've talked about today, we're gonna have to keep talking about them because we're gonna have to update and integrate new developments into this. And uh, I think today's discussion had a, a good mix of, of theory and analysis with action and, and ideas for how to get organized. And uh, I just think that we're gonna have to keep having these conversations and it's been a productive one, so thanks. Okay, Roberta. Um, well, I think I, my answer to almost all of the questions is the same, um, and that is that you can't underestimate the focus on this electoral process, it, and it's not happening uh, November 3rd, it's happening right now. Um, the involvement and the building of an infrastructure of the working class, the building of ties, I think that the eyes of the world uh, are on us. For, are, there's so much weight on this. Um, 
And uh, I think it's the opportunity for people to really experience how the system works. Um, we have to we have to be ready. We have to start taking on voter suppression right now. Um, we have to get, be dealing with voter turnout. Um, this is a it's there's nothing here that's ever. I'm almost sick over seeing on TV how it's like a done deal. You know, it is not a done deal. So in relation to that, though, I think the other thing we can do, and it's not a small thing, is to build a readership of People's World because there, these issues about international, uh, what's going on in the rest of the world, our working class is so shielded from any news or solidarity about anywhere else in the world. We don't know about strikes going on. We don't know about struggles. We don't know about the things they're doing to support us. And this is one really good place to read that and to get interpret to interpret that to be part of a real working class movement. Um, so I think that if we that this could make a real contribution to changing how the people in our country see themselves, as Joe was saying, how the British uh, or the English workers saw themselves as part of the same, you know, working class as the enslaved people, uh, the same struggle, and that we can change the consciousness of American workers, uh, and people's world can play a big role in that. Henry. Thank you. Uh, and I agree. I think all of these presentations were very, very instructive. Uh, and I look forward to looking over the slides uh, from my colleagues. Imperialism is getting more desperate and more vicious. It's attempting to prolong the age of oil. And it's, it's not uh, beyond taking advantage of the changes that are going to take place in replacing oil and, uh, uh, and fossil fuels. But we also recognize that, that militarism, uh, the, the viciousness and the, the aggression against other countries, the attacks, are obviously bleeding back into our own communities. And as someone pointed out, uh, I think Joe, uh, Martin Luther King saw this in, in 1967, and he spoke about it, and I believe that's one of the reasons he was silenced, because he connected militarism and, and anti the fight against racism, fight against militarism, the fight against poverty together. Uh, we don't, we, we have the beginning of that kind of uh, a fight, but it's just the beginning. I think we have to support these, these uh, protests in the streets, and we have to be engaged in them to the extent possible. But we also have to make the case with the protesters and the organizations that are engaged in the climate struggle, in the, in the struggle to make sure that people have the resources they need during the pandemic, in the, in the fight against uh, white supremacy. We have to make the case that this mil militarization of the police couldn't take place without the Pentagon's uh, activities around the world. And we have to take that, that budget that the Pentagon gets every year that talk about, oh, we got a trillion dollars or $2 trillion for uh, relief. But the Pentagon gets a trillion dollars every year and it's six to seven trillion dollars is paid for the wars just since 2001. We have to make that case and we have to, uh, we have to support these organizations and these protesters. We have to make the case, I'm, I say it again and again, we have, to, we have to be involved in this. And finally, we have to get Trump out it's essential to get Trump out, but we also have to hold their feet to the fire, those who replace him. That's it. Thank you, Henry and Joe. Well, uh, thanks. I, I agree completely with my uh, fellow uh, panelists. Um, I would only add that, you know, I think that we're at a turning point, tipping point kind of situation, you know? COVID, the comrade uh, asked about the environmental crisis, the economic crisis, all of them have to be addressed. And, um, um, and we need a, a series of breakthroughs in order to address them adequately. And I think that the first, um, because we've got to break the ice, you know what I'm saying? And um, we're going to have to do it on November the 4th. Is that the election day or is it the 7th? We're going to have to do it that day and then we're going to have to do it 
the day after when a new administration is put in there because we're going to have to keep the pressure on because ain't nothing going to happen automatically. We want to cut the Pentagon's budget, and we must. Bernie Sanders and them said cut it, what, 20%, 10%? I forget. There's going to be a fight, y'all. There's going to be a big fight around China. They're going to try to, we're going to have to keep the pressure on. But the first thing that we need to do when you hang up the phone today is pick up your computer and sign a petition to pass the HEROES Act. That's the most important thing that you can do. And then um, get your friends to do it because we can win this fight around the HEROES Act, the extension of unemployment for until January. It's, it's, it's critical because if it happens, it will boost our movement because it will be a victory. And if it don't happen, there's gonna be hell to pay. So, um, I think that uh, I think that that's extremely, extremely important. And the last thing I'll say is that we support a third party, absolutely. Um, the question is, we support working class and political independence, absolutely. The question is, how do we get there from from where we are? Uh, and in order to do that, you need electoral reform. You got to get rid of the electoral college. You got to change the Supreme Court, and you got to change Congress. We need we need more um, um, uh, AOCs in Congress. Ilhan, more Ilhan Omar's, more Rashidas. You know, um, what's the name of my favorite Congresswoman from Northern California? Um, we need well, Maxine Waters. Y'all know what I'm talking about. We need a Congress that will create the situation so that we can have real electoral reform so that we can create the conditions for a, a third party. And that's going to be one hell of a struggle. So uh, pass the HEROES Act. And then last thing I'm going to say is, is, is go online. And, and go to Facebook. If you're on Facebook, type in Unemployed Action. It's a group on Facebook. Join it because it's organizing unemployed workers all over the country. And the first thing that it's trying to do um, is pass the HEROES Act. I'm done. Thanks. On behalf of the National Education Commission, I would like to thank all of our panelists each of whom could have spoken at least three or four or five or six or seven times more, but they very kindly honored all of them, the uh, time restrictions within reason. We really appreciate uh, your effort. We really appreciate uh, what you did uh, for our community today. So on behalf of everyone, I thank the panelists and I thank the attendees. Uh, we look forward to continuing. We hope you will write up your presentations uh, so that people can read uh, what uh, your, your full uh, thoughts on your topic. And uh, we will make the uh, recording immediately uh, available. So onward and upward in terms of our struggle for a better world, all hands on deck. The working class is suffering around the world. We need everyone to help us and join in. Good afternoon and thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Bye-bye.